I am delighted to be here, uh, delighted to be back in uh, Vancouver. Um, even though I moved back to San Francisco, I left my heart in Vancouver. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's just, it's wonderful to be back uh, among uh, UBC and British Columbia people. Um, and it also brings to mind, as I'm sure all of this does to many of you, uh, the memory of my uh, dear colleague and friend, Clyde Hertzman, who we lost a little over a year ago. Um, much of the work that he set up and pursued um, is reflected heartily and deeply in, in uh, all that has uh, been presented thus far and, and uh, will be presented over the remaining of the, uh, of the conference. I also should just say, um, before I start, um, just how lucky we are to have Maria LaRose as the moderator of, uh, of this conference. <laughs> I, I've never shared a podium or a stage with somebody who so brilliantly lights up the, uh, uh, the field of inquiry, whatever it is that we're talking about. So I am talking to you today about uh, the orchid child and uh, the science uh, of kindness. And this is a story, as many of the presentations that you've seen are uh, stories. And for me, uh, this story begins with this kind of iconic uh, finding, which is the single most powerful and uh, carefully and ubiquitously rec replicated finding in all of child health services research, um, which is that within any given population of children, there's about 15 to 20 percent of them represented by these little guys in the dark green who are responsible for well over half of the biomedical and psychiatric morbidity within that population, and are further uh, responsible for well over half of the healthcare utilization within that uh, population uh, as well. So there is this highly, highly non-random distribution of ill health, uh, maldevelopment, and, and trouble within uh, childhood populations. It disproportionately goes to this little subgroup of children who represent about one in five of children within all of the populations of kids that we uh, deal with, teach, take care of, and so on. The, the uh, implications of this from a public health standpoint are probably obvious, which is that if we could figure out what was going on with this little 15 to 20 percent of kids, we would potentially be addressing over half of the total morbidity within that population. So the story for me really begins with this uh, best replicated finding in all of uh, health services research. However, for this, uh, for this audience um, and in this context, let me put a slightly more personal and um, sharper focus on where the motivation comes from for studying uh, kids like we're going to be uh, talking about um, in the hope that I'm not going to embarrass either myself or my audience by uh, doing this. But um, this is uh, myself <laughs> at, <laughs> at age um, about seven. Uh, with my sister, uh, Mary Elizabeth, Mary Elizabeth Boyce, who we all called Meb for her uh, initials. And um, these two kids are sort of gazing off. This is the beach behind them. They're sort of looking off onto the horizon, um, in many ways at this age, anticipating uh, a life of richness, exploration, uh, fascination, and, and so on. And this kid um, had the... Uh, great good fortune of having a life of almost uh, shameful good fortune, uh, a gratifying and productive professional career, a stable 40-year marriage, two thriving children and a grandchild that's now two months old, um, first grandchild, um, and few or no uh, disturbances of health. Um, and by contrast, um, my sister had what I would characterize as a life of disappointment and affliction. She developed a disabling chronic disease at the age of 11. She carried a diagnosis of schizophrenia by the time she was 20. She had an unwed pregnancy. Uh, she delivered a disabled child, uh, who's now uh, about 35, and uh, committed suicide at age uh, 53 uh, years of age. So here are two kids of very similar temperament, 
um, absolutely equivalent um, intelligence, uh, promise, um, very much like twins with the exception of uh, gender. So the, the question for me becomes why? Why, why did that happen and, and how did that happen? And that's the story that I want to pursue with you for the rest of uh, this time that's allotted to me. And it's a story that is focused on these twin human uh, mysteries, uh, which are why do some get sick and others do not? And what are the origins of these dramatic differences between our lives, between our developmental trajectories, between our phenotypic properties? Where do, where do those differences come from? So if you begin thinking about these 15 to 20 percent of kids who uh, experience well over half of the morbidity within the population, uh, the first answer that's given to why these, who these children are is that these must be children of low socioeconomic status. And that really comes from uh, this association, which is, uh, shows so socioeconomic status as the single most powerful epidemiologic variable that we have to predict later health outcomes, developmental outcomes, and so on. It's a variable that is so powerful and so pervasive that we don't even believe other associations unless we first controlled for socioeconomic status. And you can see why. There's this inverse monotonic association. As you go from low social class to high social class, there is this stepwise graded uh, downturn uh, in the number of limiting chronic uh, pediatric conditions, ear disease, physical inactivity, asthma, injury, and so on. With all of these most prevalent disorders of childhood, as you move up in the social class ladder, you ratchet down uh, the level of all of these uh, forms of morbidity. Now, we don't altogether know uh, why that is. Um, some of the explanations that have been given are that these kids who are growing up in conditions of uh, misfortune and, uh, and poverty uh, are exposed more to physical toxins in the environment. They have poorer diets. They have less access to health care. Uh, they have poorer housing. Uh, they are exposed to violence both within their families and within their communities. They have differences in uh, parenting experiences between uh, lower SES kids and higher SES kids. And they experience far more in the way of adversity and stress. And it is this mediating uh, variable, this explanation for the association that I want to focus on for just a moment. Because what we find, and this is from the work of Gary Evans at Cornell, is that when you look at a whole range of different adversities, uh, traumas, uh, stressors in the lives of children, and you compare children growing up in poverty to those growing up in advantaged middle income uh, families and communities, we find that there are uh, greater problems with housing density, other uh, housing problems, houses falling apart, noise pollution, uh, greater uh, levels of family turmoil and chaos, and far greater uh, exposure uh, to violence, both within the home and the neighborhood. It's also true that these childhood experiences of adversity and trauma predict not only uh, more in the way of psychiatric, psychiatric disorder and pediatric morbidities within childhood concurrently uh, in the life of a child, but they also predict these leading causes of mortality in adult life. So if you look at the number of adverse uh, childhood events, this is from the ACEs study that Vince Felitti and others uh, have done, and you look at coronary heart disease, diabetes, sexually transmitted disease, drug addiction and abuse, and suicidality, that with the increasing numbers of these adverse life events, there is this, uh, again, uh, positive monotonic association with children uh, experiencing great adversity and stress, having far more in the way of these uh, threats to life uh, in adult life. So it turns out that when you compare children from advantaged versus disadvantaged uh, communities, there are just these pervasive, uh, gnawing, uh, ubiquitous differences in the experiences of everyday life. But it's also true that with regard to responses to stress and adversity and with regard to responses to growing up in relative poverty, there's a tremendous amount of variability in these uh, findings. 
So the graph I showed you before was just summary lines that showed the, the overall relation between social class and the incidence of various chronic morbidities. This is data from one of my early studies that looked at uh, family stress on the horizontal axis here, predicting uh, behavior problem severity scores on the vertical axis. And sure enough, here's this uh, linear association. It's modest in magnitude, but it's highly significant statistically. But look at it. It's, there are, there's tremendous variability in the response to uh, family stressors. There are kids who have lots of family stress, who have very little in the way or less severe behavior problems. And there are kids who have hardly no family stress and who have uh, pretty substantial behavior problems. So substantial variability in response. Same thing here with Canadian children. This is socioeconomic status, uh, predicting uh, reading levels and uh, literacy levels uh, in a group of uh, thousands of Canadian children. This is from the work of Doug Wilms. Uh, here again is that linear association. But again, it looks like a shotgun hit the screen here. There's a tremendous amount of variability. So stressful, disadvantaged environments, impoverished environments, have highly variable effects on developmental and health outcomes. So years ago, uh, as we struggled to take the noise out of these associations by developing uh, ever more elegant measures of stress and our outcome variables, being really careful uh, psychometrically to, to do this right, we began to question whether uh, really was this variability that we were seeing noise or might it actually uh, be the music? In other words, what we really ought to be attending to, this variation in children's responsivity to the stressors that they experience. So we began to study that um, about 15, uh, maybe even as much as 20 years ago. And we studied it by bringing children into laboratory circumstances parking them in front of a, an examiner, friendly but demanding, that they had never uh, met before, and having them do a series of mildly stressful tasks that were things like watching an emotion-evoking uh, video, uh, repeating a string of digits back uh, to the examiner after she uh, gave a string of digits to the, to the child, uh, putting a little drop of lemon juice on the tongue and asking them to report on what that, was, what that uh, tasted like. So mild stressors, but things that were able to evoke the, the two um, activation of the two major stress response systems in the human brain, which are uh, the cortisol system, formerly the corticotrophin releasing hormone system that's right here in this little purple set of nuclei in the hypothalamus of the brain, and the autonomic nervous system centered here in this little blue body in the brain stem, which is responsible for igniting all of the fight or flight response that we're all uh, familiar with, the sweaty palms, the dilated pupils, the tremulousness, and, and so on. So while kids were going through this, we asked them uh, to uh, undergo uh, measurement of these, uh, re their responsivity in these two uh, major stress response systems. Um, in the autonomic system and the adrenocortical system, uh, we uh, used impedance cardiography to measure uh, the autonomic system and salivary cortisol uh, to measure uh, the output of the cortisol system. And we found that there was broad, reliable individual variability in the magnitude and patterns of response. Tremendous variability in how children responded to these very scripted, very carefully um, uh, uh, scripted um, uh, challenges. So, what did we find? Well, I'm gonna, we, we have found the same thing over and over again, and rather than just show you a summary slide of what these findings look like, I'm showing you one of the most recent, which is the interactive effects of stress biology and family context on presyndromal psychopathology. And this is from the work of Yelena Obradovich, a former postdoc who's now an assistant professor at Stanford. Uh, she was interested in marital conflict in families, low versus high, and whether that would predict presyndromal psychopathology in the children within those families. And she divided the sample up into those who in the laboratory had shown either low autonomic nervous system reactivity or high autonomic nervous system reactivity. 
in our studies, uh, the low children uh, clump and the lower uh, 80%. So the vast majority of children show, uh, show relatively low levels of autonomic reactivity versus the high uh, autonomic reactivity children who are in the top 15 to 20%. And here's what we find. First of all, when we look at the low uh, reactivity children, we find that they are largely indifferent to the level of marital conflict that they are seeing and experiencing uh, within their home environment. There may be a little pop up here in the high marital conflict, uh, the level of presyndromal psychopathology in those kids, but hardly anything really at all. What we had not expected to find, uh, we, had, we had expected this finding, which is that the high reactivity children uh, would have the highest levels of psychopathology when they were experiencing high uh, marital conflict in their homes. But what we had not expected was this, that the same kids, uh, equally uh, reactive in the autonomic nervous system, when they were in low marital conflict families, had even lower levels of presyndromal psychopathology than their low reactive counterparts. So these were kids who had either the worst outcomes or the best outcomes, depending upon the character of the environment socially that they were being reared in. To describe this, um, there are, are a number of possible interpretations here, but the one that we have sort of landed on and pursued is that this represents a kind of differential neurobiological susceptibility to social context. There are highly susceptible kids who are more responsive to both good environments and bad environments, and it shows in their, the, the excursion, the variability in their health outcomes. We took advantage of a wonderful Swedish idiomatic expression, maskrosbarn, which means dandelion child, literally in Swedish. And by this, the Swedes mean a kid who can grow up like the dandelion, sort of wherever you plant them. You know, dandelions can grow in fertile mountain fields and they can grow in the cracks and sidewalks. There may be even a couple under this rug here. These are kids who uh, show this kind of seeming indifference to the character of the social environment that they are being reared in. They're hardy and they thrive. And by contrast to that, and for shorthand, we referred to uh, these high reactive kids as orchidabarna, Swedish neologism, if you will, um, uh, orchid child. Because these were the children that had either the worst or the best outcomes and who, like the orchid, could either thrive beautifully within the right carefully monitored, carefully provided environment or perish uh, uh, suddenly, abruptly and, um, and with uh, great um, vigor if, if not in those kinds of environments. We have also found this same kind of uh, interaction with regard to genetic uh, variation. So the brain-derived neurotrophic uh, factor uh, is a uh, brain hormone uh, that has to do with brain growth and development. There is a polymorphism or a variation in that gene uh, that is divided into those who are uh, MET carriers or those who are homozygous uh, VAL. And this genetic differences difference drives this difference in the response to uh, family income circumstances on the level of daily uh, cortisol uh, expression. And here again, uh, we find this same finding that there are these orchid children who either have the highest cortisol level, the most stressed children, or the least stressed children, depending upon uh, the level of socioeconomic status that they experience within their families. It turns out as well that this, this, is, uh, this happens not just with uh, health endpoints like psychiatric disorder or cortisol secretion, but it also happens with these uh, developmental transitions that are so important. So this is going to show, this is from the Wisconsin Study of Families and Work, some work that we did with Marilyn Essex from Madison. Uh, it's going to show age on the horizontal axis. It's centered on 12 and a half years and it goes back three and forward three. And it shows pubertal development going from Tanner one to Tanner five. We all start out as ones and we all end up as fives, but it turns out that the trajectory by which you get from one to five matters. 
And it matters in this way, that if you have a too accelerated development of pubertal uh, status, you achieve uh, maturity too fast, you have a higher level of premature sexual debut, uh, the girls have higher uh, rates of, uh, of adolescent pregnancy, uh, there's greater liability to the acquisition of sexually transmitted disease, whereas if you have a, a flatter, more moderate kind of uh, trajectory of pubertal development, you have less risk in, in all of those areas. So here we have uh, a group of kids from the Wisconsin study divided into those who are high in sympathetic nervous system reactivity. Those are in the lab were, uh, sorry, these were low in reactivity. The, the blues are going to be the ones who are high in sympathetic reactivity. And they're further divided into those uh, measures uh, were low in uh, parent warmth as they taught their child uh, a, a task versus those who were high in parent-child uh, warmth. So here's what we find. We find that the, the kids who are low in sympathetic reactivity, basically whether they have a low or high warmth parent, are pretty indifferent to whether, whether uh, they have a, a parent who's encouraging, warm, nurturing, or not. They have this same kind of linear uh, growth from uh, Tanner stage one to Tanner stage five. Remember, everybody starts here, everybody ends up here. But in contrast to that, when we look at the kids who were high in sympathetic uh, nervous system reactivity, the kids who had low warmth parents had this accelerated development with a steeper close, uh, course trajectory of pubertal development, and the kids who were also high in sympathetic reactivity but who had very warm, nurturant parents basically didn't even go into puberty until 12 and a half years of age and then uh, caught up. So here again, uh, the dandelion and the orchid. The orchids having either the worst outcomes in terms of this developmental trajectory or uh, the best outcomes. Now, um, years ago, um, I had the great opportunity to go and study this same kind of phenomenon in young uh, monkeys at the NIH uh, Poolsville facility. It's basically a monkey farm. Uh, with uh, Steve Sumi. And what was interesting to me about rhesus macaques, which is the dominant animal within this, uh, within this monkey farm, is that uh, the infants of rhesus macaques seem to be born in two kind of divergent phenotypes. About 15 to 20 percent, that should ring a bell because that's what I was saying about human children, about one in five of these infant macaques are born with this phenotype of withdrawing from novelty, being very fearful, being highly reactive in biological uh, domains. Uh, they tend to sort to the bottom of the troop as they grow up. They're the ones that are late in immigrating from the maternal troop uh, as they go into adolescence. Uh, and by contrast to that, the, the other majority of, of uh, young macaques are very aggressive, very confident. Uh, they go after novelty, they swing through trees, they take risks, and so on. So there's this same kind of interesting phenotypic difference between these uh, young uh, rhesus macaques that sounds vaguely similar to that that we see in human children. So I had this chance to go and study a, a, a troop. This is a uh, rhesus macaque La Leche League meeting. <laughs> and these, these monkeys and moms were all living on this little wonderful facility that's a six-acre uh, enclosure um, in Poolsville, Maryland. It has lots of toys uh, for the monkeys to play on. It has uh, a little pond. It has an island in the middle of the pond with a playhouse. It's basically a summer camp uh, for monkeys. And uh, we had a chance to uh, study these monkeys. Right before I came, there had been this period of time when there had to be a period of uh, refurbishing and reconstruction in this six-acre uh, enclosure. And for that reason, all of the monkeys in this troop, which were about 30 or 40 uh, animals, had to be uh, put inside of a cinder block building for a period of what was supposed to be about three months. So they've, they've had six acres to roam in, and suddenly they're down in about 1,000 square feet of cinder block building with very few uh, windows and so on. It was a very, very stressful time. And like all construction, it stretched out into six, eight months. It, it went on and on. So it was a very stressful year. 
And what we found was that when we looked at the number of violent injuries of one animal versus the other uh, over the time course of this study, there was this uh, sudden uh, increase during the period of confinement uh, right here, a sudden increase where there was a five-fold uh, increase in injury incidence and severity. There were three deaths. Uh, there was a violent mobbing of one uh, individual. There was a postpartum hemorrhage that led to the, uh, the death of one of the females. And there was a degenerative uh, neurological disease uh, that, de that developed and, and came to fruition uh, in one other. And all of these deaths were in high reactivity monkeys. These were all individuals who, as young infants, had shown this characteristic uh, set of reactivity uh, um, behaviors and, and uh, biological responses. So we began to look at this in the same way that we had uh, with human children. Uh, we divided into the low and high stress year. This shows the injury incidence, the number of injuries uh, per 12-month period in uh, the, the year of the, that preceded the high stress year and the year of the confinement. And we divided the monkeys into those who had been previously uh, categorized by behavior and biology into those who were low reactive and those that were high reactivity. And here again, of course, we see the uh, orchid and uh, the dandelion. The individual animals who uh, had high reactivity during the low stress year had the lowest levels of injury of all of the animals in the troop, whereas in the high stress year, they had the highest level. So this begins to remind us of these very um, high reactive uh, individual children who are so liable uh, for injury, illness, and behavioral uh, disorder. It also may remind you a bit, uh, if you hearken back to your reading of Lord of the Flies in, in uh, William Golding's novel uh, that you read probably in high school, and you remember this character, Simon. He, he was described as a skinny, vivid little boy with a glance coming up from under a hut of straight hair that hung down. Simon felt a perilous necessity to speak, but to speak in assembly was a terrible thing to him. Maybe, he said hesitantly, maybe there is a beast. The assembly cried out savagely, and Ralph stood up in amazement. You, Simon, you believe this? I don't know, said Simon. His heartbeats were choking him. Simon became inarticulate in his effort to express mankind's uh, essential illness. So I think both in art and science, it raises the issue of whether there might be these neurobiologically sensitive children the so-called orchid child, who bear a constitutional vulnerability to scapegoating and subordination. So we have now documented this phenomenon of neurobiologic susceptibility to social context at the level of behavior, at the level of brain, at the level of circuitry and synapse performance, at the level of genome and epigenome. And a question that remained to us was whether uh, we could also see the same kind of phenomenon at the level of society. So if we come back for a moment to this um, iconic uh, inverse association between socioeconomic status and health, percentage of kids with all of these different uh, disorders, this is what we see within uh, human societies. But the question is whether uh, these, all of these explanations that I went through before, the toxins, access to care, diet, housing, violence, and so on, whether beyond these kind of surface, most visible uh, differences uh, that may be driving socioeconomic uh, uh, disparities in health, like uh, the forces that drive this little uh, sailboat on this vast ocean, whether there might be also deeper currents that are built into uh, human nature into the fabric of who we are as a species that also drive these deeper currents of social uh, inequality. And more specifically, the question of whether within these little societies, these little social groups that children form, maintain, and live within, whether there is evidence of this same kind of social inequality. The question really of whether there is a conserved species typical pattern of group behavior such as social hierarchical ordering and whether there is a biological embedding of chronic subordination and social marginalization as a consequence of that hierarchical ordering. We know, for example, that as low down in phylogeny as African cichlid fish, 
that they maintain these very severe hierarchical organizations in which only the dominant males have reproductive access to females. We know that rats, now we're into mammals, uh, in, a, in a subordination paradigm, show these shifts toward infl inflammation uh, that are mediated by cytokine signaling pathways. We know that primates, uh, all of the species of primates, more or less, show formal, uh, form stable, linearly transitive social hierarchies. And we know that subordinate positions within these hierarchies are associated with upregulated cortisol functioning, with impaired immune competence, and with decreased resistance to disease. And we also know that young children form social orders within weeks of entering uh, new social groups. The medical students that I teach hate this reality, but it is in fact a reality, and there are probably teachers in the audience here who can confirm that children, 20 children coming together, five-year-olds in a kindergarten classroom, they haven't met before, within a few weeks there's a pecking order that's quite visible and uh, where uh, position within that hierarchy can be assigned. So the question we wanted to address was whether subordinate positions in these early peer hierarchies were associated with greater stress, exaggerated reactivity, and express, excessive uh, stress-related morbidity. So we began uh, a study of 29 uh, public school kindergarten classrooms in Berkeley, California, uh, all uh, five-year-old children. We uh, define social dominance as a pattern of repeated encounters in which the outcome consistently favors the same member of that dyad. We did dominance observations where we brought research assistants into these classrooms, had them sit there, and they did critical event and scan sampling over a period of three to five weeks. They became like a potted plant in the classroom and they just sat there and they recorded uh, dyadic and triadic interactions. And the behaviors that we looked at were things like physical attack, imitation, directing behavior, threat, relational uh, aggression. And at the end of this period of time, we were able within each classroom to assign children a position within this peer uh, hierarchy. Uh, there was no difference in uh, gender uh, representation at the high or low uh, end of this hierarchy. Boys and girls were equally likely uh, to occupy either end of the spectrum. The important point is that these were replicable observations that generated a position within uh, the classroom. So I'm, I want to just show you a brief snippet of some of the behaviors that, um, uh, that we were looking at so you get more of a feel for uh, what these actually were. Can I make and actually, before I, I start this, um, lest you uh, begin to suspect that these kindergartners from Berkeley are sort of uh, the Darth Vader uh, contrast to uh, Felix's uh, Jedi warriors of altruism. <laughs> I, I, want you, I want you to notice, all, as, as cute as those, I mean, those are really wonderful video clips, but I want you to notice that it's hard to assign altruism or selfishness to many of these behavior, if not most of these behaviors. So this is a, an emergent property of social groups that grows not so much out of individual uh, behaviors as out of a kind of group process uh, that emerges over weeks of time. Okay, so this is following behavior. You're gonna see, uh, whoop. Two little girls who are playing with each other. This little girl gets up and walks away. She runs off, but she keeps her eye on this girl. And when she goes to start a new activity, the other little girl follows. So it's an example of following the lead of another child. This is imitation. Uh, this little girl, they're in a pretend little apartment. She's taken off her socks and shoes and is going to get into this bed. And this little girl is going to very fastidiously follow her example. So this is an imitation. Mom 
has taught her that socks go back in the shoes. And she goes and pops into bed too. So this is an example of imitation behavior. Here's a displacement. These two boys are digging and they don't see it at first, but this little girl comes up and starts digging in their spot. So then this guy in yellow sees that she's digging where he was digging, and he comes and physically displaces her. And then she comes around and more gently, but also physically displaces the fireman. So that's an example of a triadic interaction. So directing behavior. Now she's decided she doesn't want to dig anymore, and he's decided he doesn't want her to leave. You need to come back. You need to come back. The, the men in, your room, in the room just quell your embarrassment. Come it's, back to digging. Hello. Please come to digging. He physically restrains her, runs after her, And then he decides, maybe if I just talk to her. Comes back. Here's leadership. These guys are playing in a pretend kitchen. And this fellow is going to call a fire alarm. Oh, a fire, a fire, a fire alarm. Fire alarm, Peter. Fire, fire. So the red and yellow guy follow him out of the kitchen. And then when he calls the fire alarm off, they follow him back into the kitchen. And then there's just good old physical attack, which we're all familiar with. So obviously, no one of these interactions is going to tell you really anything substantive about the relationship between those two children. But you, when you accrue thousands of these observations over five weeks of time, we, we had about 36,000 observations in these 29 uh, uh, kindergarten classrooms, you begin to be able to mathematically arrange these kids in a hierarchical order. So this is familiar to you within societies. There is this graded association between health and social position. The question really is, within 338 kindergarten children in Berkeley, 29 public schools, will the same kind of relationship hold? And in fact, it does. And in fact, what we find is that subordinate children, which are going to be shown on the left-hand side of these horizontal axes, this is the boys and the girls, the subordinate children sustain higher rates of depression and, and inattention. They have poorer peer relationships, and they have poorer academic competence. And it appears to be a bit more dramatic in the boys than it is in the girls. That's not the end of the story, though, uh, because one of the things I didn't tell you about this socioeconomic gradient in health is that there are different steepnesses, different slopes of this gradient in different uh, countries. So there's variability in the SES development relation from nation to nation, and the slopes are flattest in countries with the more egalitarian social politics. So for example, very steep in Northern Ireland, in the US, Canada is pretty steep as well, but you get into the Scandinavian countries like Sweden, and you begin to see a kind of moderating of that slope. It becomes uh, closer to horizontal. We had our research assistants keep coming back and telling us that there are class, class cultures here that are very different from one to another. There are teachers that handle the dominance hierarchy of the children very different from, uh, from others. So we began to actually study that and try to understand what the culture was within these individual uh, classrooms. Again, 29 classrooms in Berkeley. 
And we found that there is tremendous variability in social position development gradients by classroom climate. And in particular, we looked at the level of learner-centered practices. This was developed by a group at Stanford, this measure. It measures egalitarian practices on the part of the teacher. Some of the teachers would go out of his or her way to display uh, the, and, and put on display the strengths and the talents of the kids who they knew were at the lower end of the hierarchy. Uh, there was just a spirit within the classroom of more egalitarian, more caring, more individual focused uh, pedagogy. And what we were able to show was that at the highest level of these classroom learner-centered practices, this association between social position and teacher-reported depression basically disappears. The, the slope goes from uh, very steep and it rotates around to where it's almost not there at all in the classrooms that had these most egalitarian, most uh, caring kinds of uh, cultures. So we have this conserved predisposition across species to hierarchical social organization. Social subordination per se appears to be associated with diminished health and development, irrespective of the scale or complexity of the social context that we're talking about. And the consequences of inequality can be tempered by the social climate and culture uh, shaped by those who teach and lead. So I'm going to... I'm getting toward the end here, and I want to talk with you about how do these dandelion, orchid, dominant, and subordinate phenotypes arise. And we think they arise in the same way that these strikingly different butterflies um, arise. These look very much like two completely different species of butterfly. There's obviously a dramatic difference in color. There are differences in these little eyelets patterns on the, on the wings. But this is, in fact, um, the same species of buckeye butterfly. And this is a polyphenism that's driven by the temperature and the length of daylight when the butterfly emerges from the pupil uh, phase. This represents a conditional adaptation that involves differential epigenetic regulation of genes determining wing coloration and pattern. What is epigenetic? There is epigenetic control of the genes uh, that guide brain development and function and uh, intimately uh, affect the outcome developmentally of what children look like, uh, what, how children behave, their risk for uh, adversity, for uh, psychosocial morbidity, and so on. If you unravel a chromosome, this is all being unraveled here, and you look at finer and finer detail, you see something called chromatin, which is basically the packaging of the strand of DNA that, as it lies within the chromosome. So this is chromatin, and this is chromatin. DNA is the blue uh, line. Uh, the DNA is wrapped around this octamer, this group of eight histone proteins, and it's like beads on a string. But notice the difference. This is very tightly packed, and this is very loosely packed. And it turns out that that is a crucial difference because the enzyme that comes along and wants to decode the DNA can easily get at the DNA when it's in this conformation, but has a very difficult time getting at it when it's in this conformation. So this chromatin is difficult to read and for the DNA to be expressed. This is easily read and expressed, and it turns out that the difference between the tightly packed and the loosely packed chromatin has to do with these chemical tags that are placed at times on the DNA or on the histone uh, proteins and have this effect of loosening or tightening the chromatin structure. Where do those chemical tags come from? Well, they come from experiences of stress and adversity. Not stress and adversity alone. You can have epigenetic changes that come from exposure to toxins and, and other uh, forms of, of uh, human exposure. But certainly there's a now emerging literature showing that experiences of stress and adversity differentially tag uh, the chromatin, the DNA, and the histone proteins. And as a result, there's a difference in the expression of the genes uh, within that uh, individual cell. So we had a chance to test this epidemiologically, again with the Wisconsin Study of Families and Work. This is a study that began in the second trimester of pregnancy with almost 600 uh, fetuses. 
there was a period of time all through the child's uh, growing up, infancy, preschool, primary school, high school, the kids were followed to the end of uh, high school. Uh, all along this uh, period of time, parents were asked to report uh, stressors and particularly uh, reported on both maternal and paternal stressors in the infancy and preschool periods. And in mid-adolescence, we were able to do epigenetic profiling of buccal epithelial cells that are harvested from the lining uh, of the mouth. And here's what we find. We find that there are these epigenetic vestiges of early parental stressors. This graph shows the methylation level. Uh, this is neutral, this is hypermethylation, and this is undermethylation. It's divided into the red, that are the mother stressors predicting the level of methylation, and the blue, the father stressors predicting the level of methylation, and further divided into infancy and preschool periods. So we find that the mother stressors, in inf infancy in particular, were related to differences, hypermethylation, for both girls and boys. And we find that father stressors in preschool were associated with demethylation differences, primarily for girls. And we have argued that this pattern of differential methylation is an association consistent with known developmental time courses for uh, parental influence, for the influence of, of uh, two parents. So when we ask nature, nurture, or a bit of both, it's almost always, I think, going to turn out that it's a bit of both. We find that there are adverse effects of social conditions that are contingent upon genetic susceptibility. We find that gene-environment interplay guides developmental calibration of this phenomenon of susceptibility to context, and that results in some who are more sensitive to both negative and positive social conditions. And we find that risks to development and health are derived then from epigenetic processes involving both early conditions and genetic susceptibility. So these epigenetic marks, these chemical tags on the DNA and the histone proteins actually constitute a physical nexus, a point of connection between genes and environments. So returning to uh, the story of me and my sister, why and how did this uh, dramatic divergence in fortune and, and in uh, uh, good uh, versus aversive lives uh, come about? Well, I think that it probably has to do with my sister being a floridly orchid child, uh, an unshared family environment. In other words, we were probably raised in different uh, families in certain ways. Sibling differences in genomic risk, probably difference, obviously, in birth order or gender. But at the bottom of, of it all, the complexity of these complex epigenetic interactions between allelic or genetic variation and variation in the experienced uh, family environment. What we are all, everyone in this room I know, is uh, committed and, and wanting to do is to, uh, in the words that Robert Kennedy used to famously uh, attribute to Aeschylus, uh, to tame the savageness of man and make gentle uh, the life of this world. So let me conclude by ob observing that while it is a reality that children build the same hierarchical societies that their adult counterparts build, that's stratified by dominance and power, it is also true that caring, skilled adults can find a pedagogy of kindness and create more egalitarian childhood relationships within these little uh, spheres, these little societies uh, that we uh, encounter as teachers or uh, physicians or whatever. It is also the reality that some children are imperiled by their exquisite sensitivity to aversive, destructive social contexts. But it is also true that the same orchid-like children can thrive and flourish in uncommon ways within nurturing supportive uh, social conditions. It tempts me to, to speculate that there may in fact be no human frailty that lies beyond the possibility of redemption, that in everything that we think of as a frailty, as a weakness within humankind, that there may be social environments in which that uh, apparent frailty may thrive and do uh, well. 
This is a note that was handed to me years ago by a little girl, an eight-year-old patient with chronic abdominal pain. She slipped it to me as she left the clinic. And at the bottom of this note, it shows three big girls and her there on the right-hand side. And she says, I got left out when the big kids tease me and my heart's like breaking. Here is a young man, Tim Kretschmer, a secondary student in Germany, who on the night prior to a shooting rampage in which he killed 15 people, wrote on the internet, I am sick of this messy life, always the same, everyone makes fun of me, no one recognizes my potential, I am serious. And in maybe the most uh, uh, spectacular or uh, newsworthy uh, um, expression of this same phenomenon, uh, is this recent uh, Occupy Wall, Wall Street movement where, uh, as I interpret it, an entire generation has come to terms with the inequalities that a society presents to it. What all of these uh, experiences or phenomena have in common is social stratification, subordination, stress and adversity, inequality in life chances. We all know that social relationships are important. And they are particularly important in a time when in North America there is more inequality than there has been ever since the, the time uh, of the Great Depression. This just shows income inequality during the Depression uh, and at present. So I will end here with this favorite quote from Ernest Hemingway who in A Farewell to Arms wrote that the world breaks everyone and afterward many are strong in the broken places. I've become increasingly convinced over my 35 years as a pediatrician and child health researcher that the world does indeed break everyone, even our children, and that one of our responsibilities as physicians, as teachers, as administrators, as social workers, uh, is to help uh, children become strong in broken places. Thank you. <laughs>